The next session, number five, is the placement and designs of small wind turbines. And um, uh, the next will be David Wood uh, with a speech of uh, development of blade element uh, modeling for small wind turbines. Uh, David Wood, are you there? I am here, yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes, very well. And I can see you very well as well. <laughs> Good, thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, I am told I can share my screen, so it looks like I can. So I shall start the presentation. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you everyone for uh, allowing me to present here. I looked through the participant list and I know quite a few of the people attending. So hello to all the people that I know as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, developments in blade element modeling for horizontal axis wind turbines. This is totally a talk about horizontal axis turbines. And I'm telling you about some recent work that I have done in collaboration with a number of colleagues. And I want to acknowledge uh, very strongly that collaboration with Eric Limicker at Princeton University, uh, Valerie Okolov at DTU, and uh, Jerson Vaz at the Federal University of the Para in Brazil. Um, so here is an outline of the talk. I'm going to give you a very, very brief introduction to blade element momentum theory for the design or the analysis of small horizontal axis wind turbines, then talk about two of the major challenges that haven't been properly addressed in the theory, and that is the effect of the flow expansion and how to modify the theory when you have a finite number of blades. It's relatively easy to derive the equations when you have it, what's called an actuated disk or an infinite number of blades representing the turbine. And I'm going to tell you about some new work that we've been doing recently on impulse theory. Um, and this is a alternative way to derive the equations for um, wind turbine analysis that I think has a lot of promise. Um, and the uh, emphasis here, or one of the reasons why we're doing this work is that we're interested in unusual small turbines. For example, I have a long-standing interest in how you design diffuser augmented wind turbines, which I'll talk about a bit later on. Um, turbines with sweat blades, in other words, blades that are curved in the plane of rotation. And before I go any further, I need to give you two health warnings. Uh, this talk describes work that's in progress. Uh, it's not a polished presentation of mature results. It's a progress report. Uh, the work is difficult. Um, so in a 20 minute presentation, all I can do is give you a flavor of it. And I hope that's uh, what I'll be able to achieve. Okay, so here is the motivation for this work. If you look at flow visualizations um, of uh, the flow through wind turbines, and I'm just pulling up the laser pointer. Uh, this is a beautiful photograph from an experiment at the ECN in the Netherlands, where smoke is released from two of the blade tips, and you can see the very strong helical vortices that are formed uh, downstream of the wind turbine. Um, if you look at propellers, and propellers are also a technology that can be analyzed with blade element theory. In, uh, in fact, blade element theory was first developed for aircraft propeller design, you can see trailing from the tips of all four propellers here are uh, very coherent helical vortices. Um, so it's clear from these slow visualizations that vorticity is important, um, but what is its role and how does it uh, help to produce our thrust and torque on the wind turbine blades? Um, so this is where we dive into the deep end of the analysis. So what we're looking at is shown uh, schematically by the figure on the top right. The flow comes towards the disc of the wind turbine shown in grey there. And clearly a real wind turbine has a small number of blades. So finite blade effects are important. And the flow has to expand. The purpose of a wind turbine is to extract kinetic energy from the wind. And in order to do that, uh, the flow has to slow down, which means it expands as it goes through the rotor and then into the far wake uh, well behind the rotor. 
The conventional analysis that is done for wind turbine thrust and torque and power uh, uses conventional uh, control volume techniques. In other words, we take a control volume a little bit like the volume that's shown in the figure here, and we apply uh, this equation here, which gives us an expression for the forces acting on the control volume in terms of the pressure and the velocity of the flow into and out of the control volume. And I should emphasize that this analysis is for steady flow only and anybody that's had anything to do with turbines of any size knows that the, the wind is far from steady. And I'll come back to that point right at the end of the presentation. Um, so this is the conventional approach, uh, which has the downside that it includes the pressure. And to me, it also has the downside that, that there's no direct information about the vorticity in this formulation of the force field. If we go to an impulse uh, form of the same equation, uh, we get the pressure coming out of the equation to be replaced by terms that involve the vorticity, omega here and omega here is vorticity. So the attraction of, of looking at this in terms of impulse is that it appears to be a natural way in which we can introduce the role of vorticity into wind turbine aerodynamics. And that is particularly important, I think, uh, when the flow is expanding through the blades. Uh, if you're interested in following up the details of this, um, Eric Limicker and I have just published uh, the derivation of the thrust equation using the impulse analysis, um, and we're working on extending that now. Okay, so here, here is what we get out of uh, that impulse analysis for the wind turbine thrust, capital T, uh, usually talked about in terms of a thrust coefficient, uh, the thrust divided by a half times the density, wind speed squared, pi r squared being the uh, area of the swept area of the blades. The interesting thing about the impulse formulation is that it gives the thrust in terms of the circumferential velocity. Uh, rather than the axial velocity, which is what you get in the conventional equation. Um, and that carries over to blade element theory as well, because what blade element theory does is to divide this finite control volume or this large control volume into a number of stream tube annulus or annuli that intersect the blades. So the dotted lines here show one of those uh, stream tubes intersecting the blades. And where that intersection occurs, we have a blade element. So what we do in blade element theory is look at the change in momentum, axial momentum and angular momentum in the stream tube and compare that to the forces that are acting on the blade. And a blade for a horizontal axis wind turbine has to be an airfoil. So we think of that in terms of, um, of the lift and drag of the airfoil section. And again, further details uh, you can get from the paper that I ref referenced down the bottom here. And so the key thing uh, that if you uh, look at impulse, you get the thrust in terms of the circumferential velocity, which is in the direction uh, that I'm showing with the uh, laser pointer, rather than the axial velocity, which is the direction out of the page. Okay, but you possibly had noticed that uh, when we derived that equation, there was no specific mention of the vorticity. And this is one of the ironic features of the analysis whose details we are still trying to work out. But if the vorticity follows the streamlines, in other words, if the vortex lines follow the streamlines, then the contribution of the vortex terms to the uh, thrust cancel out and we're actually able to reproduce the conventional uh, equation for the thrust in terms of the axial velocity u, which is sometimes uh, equivalently stated as the axial induction factor. However, in order to make that cancellation, the helical vortices that I showed you in the flow visualization have to have constant radius and pitch. So the uh, conversion of the impulse equation to the conventional equation for the thrust is only valid if there's no flow expansion or uh, paradoxically, if the flow expands extremely rapidly behind the wake, uh, behind the rotor and then stays at constant uh, radius. So 
Um, the uh, consequence of, of that analysis is that given that this equation is not valid in the presence of flow expansion, it should not be used in blade element momentum theory. And that raises a question, how do you actually deal with flow expansion? And our um, very initial attempts at uh, analyzing this situation I'm going to talk about now, uh, what we did was to analyze a situation that if you have say three blades here, you have three trailing vortices from each of those blades, or a, one trailing vortices from each of the three blades. And here's a very poor attempt at drawing the path of that vortex. Uh, here's an experiment with a rotor. You can just see the rotor um, at the front here, the, the dark blades and the uh, vorticity shed from the tips of those blades is illuminated and you can see it clearly there. Um, this is a very simplistic analysis that is really a cartoon of what happens in reality. But what it shows is here, for example, the ratio of the axial velocity induced at the blades compared to the velocity in the far wake. In standard blade element theory, the, it is assumed that that ratio is a half. And we see here that it starts off at a half at the axis of rotation, but reaches a value of one near the tip of the rotor. If we look at the radial velocity, which is a very interesting velocity component to view because it's usually ignored in any blade element analysis, um, the radial velocity is important when the flow expands. So you can see here, uh, I've replotted the results for the axial velocity U here. And on the top line, I've plotted the radial velocity here. And you can see that the radial velocity indeed gets very large near uh, the tips of the, of the rotor. And also very interesting, and also very interestingly, um, the radial velocity is non-zero outside the wake. And in fact, the axial velocity is non-zero outside the wake. And this is a consequence of the fact that the expansion of the flow redistributes momentum from the external flow uh, to the wake. And uh, we've got uh, a fairly long and fairly complicated argument to support that. And we're finalizing the details of that in a manuscript that I hope uh, we will be submitting uh, sometime in the near Okay, so the provisional results that we get from that very simple analysis of the flow through a uh, wind turbine rotor is that the far wake area is about 1.6 times the rotor area compared to twice uh, the rotor area that occurs in the standard Betts uh, Joukowsky limit, which a number of you will know as the Betts limit, but there's a strong argument to credit Joukowsky, the Russian. Uh, aerodynamicists with co-discovering it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in practical terms, there is the important result that expansion reduces the maximum power, um, typically by about 6%. So the betz joukowsky limit of 0.593 comes down to about 0.56 in the presence of expansion. And of course, expansion is a necessary feature of of extracting a significant amount of power from the wind. Uh, we've seen that expansion causes significant radial velocity and that radial velocity may well have an impact on the lift and drag acting on the blade elements. And that's another line that we're following up. Um, it also alters the relationship between the velocities at the rotor and the far wake. And it induces axial and radial velocity outside the wake. So there's a lot of consequences of the fact that the, the flow necessarily expands as it goes through a wind turbine in order to extract power. And as I said at the beginning, um, uh, that the effects of that are not well known. And most of the statements that I've made here, even though they're sort of general statements, have not really been appreciated uh, in late element momentum theory uh, beforehand. Okay, um, so that, that's a sort of general uh, summary of where we're up to in analyzing the effects of uh, expansion. Now I want to move on uh, to consider the effects of having a finite number of blades. And again, I can't give you any of the detail of this, um, 
because it would take probably at least an hour to go through the necessary mathematics. So just uh, hopefully a good enough flavor of it to get an idea of what we're doing. The issue is with the finite number of blades can be looked at in several ways. My particular favorite is that if you look at the flow through this annular stream tube that's defined by the dotted lines, then the change in momentum and angular momentum in that stream tube depends upon the average values for that stream tube. However, if we look at the forces acting on a blade element as an airfoil section, those forces are due to the velocities at the blade element. And there can be a difference between the stream tube average velocities and the velocities at the elements. And that is the fundamental uh, effect of finite number of blades on wind turbine aerodynamics. Um, we've coined the term finite blade functions uh, for the, the finite blade function in the, for the axial velocity F subscript U and for the circumferential velocity F subscript W. And these are defined as the ratio of the stream tube average to the value at the blade. And as I said, we need the value at the blade in order to compute the lift and the drag on the airfoil section. And similarly for FW, uh, it's defined as a stream tube average divided by the value at the blade. If you know anything about blade element theory or blade element momentum analysis, uh, you will know that in most cases, uh, these effects are approximated by what's called the Prandtl tip loss factor, F subscript P, and you can't actually see uh, clearly here because when I enlarged the image here, I um, I uh, got rid of, I, I, I covered the symbols here. This, this line says that the assumption that's normally made is FP equals FU equals FW. Oh, um, this work where uh, on how to calculate the induced uh, velocities in terms of FU and FW, uh, we've submitted a paper on that, uh, that is currently under revision and hopefully will be accepted within the next couple of months, so it'll be out there in the public domain. Okay, so uh, situations where the Prandtl tip loss factor can't be used uh, or should not be used at low tip speed ratio is a particularly important one. The, the, the Prandtl tip loss becomes more accurate at high tip speed ratio. If the vortex pitch vary significantly across the rotor, the circumferential induced velocity is different from the axial velocity, and that's not accounted for in Prandtl's formulation. If we have a diffuser augmented wind turbine, and I'm coming back to some of these unusual geometries that I'm interested in, a diffuser augmented wind turbine has finite loading at the tips because of the proximity to the shroud or the, or the duct that it's sitting in, and the Prandtl tip loss factor doesn't take that into account. If blades are swept in the plane of rotation or curved in the axial direction, uh, the, tip the Prandtl tip loss factor does not account for what's called the bound vorticity of the blades influencing those velocities. And if you have unequally loaded blades, uh, the Prandtl tip loss factor is also not cor correct. And what I'm doing here in this slide is giving you an example uh, of what we found. We did this analysis a little while ago um, because we recognize that if you have a diffuser augmented wind turbine, and here's a beautiful photograph of a 400 watt uh, diffuser augmented wind turbine as part of the power system for a remote uh, communication system. So a diffuser augmented wind turbine has uh, the normal turbine rotor. In this case, there is six blades and it encloses the rotor with a diffuser or a duct. And the purpose of the duct is to induce more flow uh, through the blades and therefore increase the power output. And what we showed uh, for a tip speed ratio of seven, that um, 
the finite blade functions, FU and FW, they're almost coincident for the, the case that we analyzed because the picture of the vortex doesn't change across the rotor. So here's the axis of rotation. Here is the tip of the blades. And you can see the difference between the new finite blade functions and the Prandtl tip loss factor, which actually goes to zero at the blade tips. This is a poor uh, drawing that doesn't show that clearly. And we find that uh, with the uh, finite blade functions, we get an increase in the power output of about 6%. So to summarize, um, our uh, current work is aimed at understanding how uh, expansion affects the equations that are used in blade element momentum theory. And in practical terms, we're looking at that in terms of modifying a uh, computer program that I've had for blade element momentum theory for many years. And we're assessing the effects of the radial velocity that must be associated with the expansion on the performance of the lift and the drag elements. Um, for future work, and I hope this is, we'll be able to get onto some of this stuff uh, later this year, um, I want to extend the analysis of expansion to diffuser augmented wind turbines, um, because as far as I know, there is no theoretical limit on the performance of a diffuser augmented wind turbine. Uh, is there a corresponding betz Joukowsky limit for diffuser augmented wind turbines? Because if we could establish that, then we would have a very strong performance criteria, just as we have for bare turbines, we could extend that to diffuser augmented turbines. Uh, we want to look at the role of vortex expansion on the finite blade functions because I didn't emphasize it, I didn't even say it when I introduced the finite blade functions, but those finite blade functions are derived for constant uh, radius vortices because the mathematics of it is much easier. Um, and we're interested in what happens at high thrust when the basic one-dimensional equations that give rise to the conventional axial momentum equation breakdown. Um, there is some reason to believe that the impulse formulation is going to lead to a good description of these effects. And then finally, right at the end, is the holy grail of wind turbine aerodynamics. Uh, can we actually develop an accurate, unsteady blade element momentum theory? Because everybody knows that wind turbines always operate in an unsteady manner. And if we can extend the ideas that we, I have presented here to the unsteady case, um, then there are lots of benefits in terms of things like improving real-time control of wind turbines of all sizes. So that's something that uh, may not happen for a while yet, but there are also good indications that the um, the impulse formulation that I showed you earlier, when you extend that to unsteady flow, it's much easier than the equivalent unsteady formulation of the conventional equations. So we've got some uh, optimism there that the impulse formulation will be extremely uh, important there. And I'm pretty sure, uh, yes, that is the end of my talk. So thank, thank you for listening. And I hope despite the health warnings that I gave you at the beginning, uh, that there was enough there to get a sense of uh, where we can go with improving blade element uh, modeling for small wind turbines. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Very interesting and very interesting that it's not only the big, big wind turbines, but all the small wind turbines who are Focus. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for uh, David Wood or comments? I have a question, if it's all right. Yes. Uh, thank you, David. Very interesting talk, as per usual, and uh, very enjoyable. Gets one's brain really thinking. Um, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit, uh, especially on the expansion aspect of things. Um, often we tend to use a stream tube upstream of the rotor equivalent, uh, essentially to the rotor area. But uh, in the real world, the stream tube of that area starts to expand before the rotor and the rotor actually only sees a smaller fraction of that actual stream tube. Um, yet we still continue to use that original stream tube as a measure of the scaling essentially 
And mm -hmm. what do you think perhaps we should maybe um, not use that, but use a certain fraction of that to get a more realistic approach of what we really see in the real world? What do you think of that? Uh, I think that's a very good point um, that is still open. Um, what, if you think about it in terms of the vortex structure of the wake, and uh, it's, uh, at a, as an aside, Ken, it's really nice to see the diffuser augmented wind turbine behind you. Uh. Um, uh, then everything that happens upstream of the blades is dictated by the trailing vorticity. Um, so in a sense, if you can get that right and you can get that expansion right, then you will automatically get right the upstream flow. Oh, okay, okay. So that's, that's sort of what we're working on. There are a few specific things. So I didn't point it out when I showed those calculations of the axial and the radial velocity at the rotor. Um, but the way we get those calculations, it, it's a very rough... Uh, approximation to a free weight method. So we, we actually assume the vortex pitch is constant because that simplifies the mathematics, but we have a generic equation for the expansion of that. And we get the parameters in that expansion equation by balancing what's happening at the rotor. So uh, the, the ratio of the radial velocity to the axial velocity at the rotor gives a slope of, of the trailing vorticity surface. And we derived another result uh, in our first impulse uh, paper that the integral of uh, V squared minus A squared has to be zero at the rotor. So that means that if you integrate uh, the radial velocity squared minus E, induced axial velocity squared uh, from the axis of rotation to infinity at the rotor, that sum has to be equal to zero. And that turns out to be extremely important in terms of uh, matching the uh, vortex structure to the streamlines. And if you do all that, then we automatically get the fact that only um, a small, well, about two thirds of the rotor area uh, is captured in the upstream flow. Ah, okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. But it's still, it's still not entirely clear. Well, I'm looking forward to reading about it. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Are there other uh, comments or questions? Otherwise, we'll go to the next speaker. Uh, excuse me? Yes. Short question. I'm not. I'm not sure the answer will be short as this. Uh, how far could you compare your uh, model uh, results with regard to uh, efficiency of your uh, turbine with respect to the measurements you have done in the field? Yeah, and that's that's that is an ultimate goal. Um, uh, in developing the computer code that implements the blade element uh, method, uh, we are using experiments uh, from a small wind turbine that were done in a wind tunnel at, at NTNU in, in Norway. And we do that because you know, a wind tunnel environment is very well controlled. It's about the only place in the world where you actually get steady flow. Uh, so we think that that's, that's the best place to start with the comparison of these ideas to the reality. And we've done that and we've got some very interesting results. We can get the very high thrust levels that they've measured. They measure thrust coefficients well in excess of one. Our, our, our method uh, predicts that without any uh, so-called high thrust corrections, but there's still some issues. Um, uh, we have a problem that I like to call dark thrust. You know, we talk about dark energy and dark matter in cosmology because they're things that we know exist, but we don't know of what form. Uh, we're missing at, at least one term in our thrust equation because uh, when we compare it to the measurements, we get a discrepancy that in some cases is significant. And we're looking at the basic formulation of the of the equations to see what we've missed or what we could add to it. You know, I guess a little bit like Einstein's cosmological term. Yeah, so yeah. And then the stage after that is to go to the field. But uh, the problem with the field is that you probably know that 
you're, you, you're averaging all your measurements all the time you know, because you're in an unsteady environment. I think the real benefit of this work, if, if it can be extended to unsteady analysis, is really going to be in terms of real-time control of wind turbines. Because if you look at the control literature, um, often very sophisticated control methods are tacked on to very simplified blade element models of, of wind turbines. Now, if we can get a good generic model for the unsteady behavior of a wind turbine, uh, that could be fed into a real-time control algorithm to improve the energy extraction. So you may not actually in increase the efficiency of your turbine in the strict definition of efficiency, but you could well get more power out of it. Yeah, it's a, it's a tantalizing prospect. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I hope that, uh, I think all of us hope that you'll continue with us uh, next.